with over 1 million members. We know what people can do when they come together. We are Rotary. We are people of action. Find out more at rotary.org slash action. Hello, hello. I'm Pamela Smith, Communications Director for the Little Rock School District and friend of the Rotary Club of Little Rock. And I'm excited to be here to share in what we know is going to be an awesome occasion today. You know, with the global pandemic, COVID-19, it's changed the way all of us communicate, really, and Rotary Clubs are no exception. Zoom, GoToMeeting, and Google Hangout, they're all becoming part of our popular vernacular. And as you might expect, with District 6150, it's no exception in terms of how we are able to reach out and connect with each other. So for the first time, the district conference is going to be completely virtual. We know that many of you look forward to gathering together from all across the district to see old friends and to learn what's happening in other clubs. And we've included many clubs and videos and opportunities for your interaction with our panelists and our presenters today. So please take a second right now to comment and let us know that you're watching and what club you represent, no matter where you are in the world. Our time together is going to be short today, but I promise you it will be the most exciting virtual conference one might have. So our intent is to celebrate all of the work our clubs have been doing this year and just how resilient Rotarians are. In a moment, we will have current and former youth exchange students being joining us actually from Thailand and Brazil. I know you're excited about that. We will be speaking also with club leaders from four clubs who had tremendous membership growth this year. And we'll celebrate the good works that Rotarians do to support the Rotary Foundation. We'll hear from three clubs who made a huge impact on the community through service. And that's what Rotarians are all about, right? service. We're going to end our time together today with an award celebration presented by District Governor George Frey, and we know you're definitely looking forward to that. I'm proud to host the 2020 Rotary District 61 virtual conference and see how Rotary connects the world. It's my honor now to introduce a Rotarian who has led the district through these unprecedented times from the Rotary Club of Lawrence County. Please help us welcome District Governor George Frey. Thanks, Pam. We appreciate you being with us today. And I want to thank everyone for attending this district conference. I want to acknowledge those who have uh, played a big role in uh, bringing this about today. And uh, if it wasn't for Sidney Gilbert, Sam Hummelstein, and Hatton Weeks, who have worked so hard and contributed so much for this and made so many sacrifices. But today, let's focus on who we are and enjoy these next three hours, reflecting on the year that we have made together. Thank you very much. We are, we are excited to uh, continue our wonderful conversations and discussions today. And again, we want to thank everyone for putting this panel and program together because we know that you're going to leave today feeling uplifted, inspired, encouraged, and motivated to continue service. As you probably are aware, because you're connected to a, a lot of exciting young people doing phenomenal things all across the globe, Rotary believes in developing the next generation of leaders. And our programs help young leaders not only build leadership skills, but expand their education, and also, most importantly, learn the value of service. Our district supports the Rotaract Interact, Rotary Youth Leadership Award, and Youth Exchange programs. Rotary Youth Exchange builds peace one young person at a time. Students learn a new language, they discover another culture, and they truly become global citizens. Today, we are joined by District Youth Exchange co-chair, Mr. Vince Guest from the Rotary Club of Wynn, and today's moderator, Mr. Hatton Weeks, of the Rotary Club of Jonesboro. Vince? Yes, Pam. You can take it away. Oh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate being here today and having the opportunity to speak about youth exchange. Uh, it's one of my passions. 
and it also gives our local clubs the opportunity uh, to be involved in one of Rotary's uh, main focuses, promoting peace and understanding uh, throughout the world and being involved on that on a local level. Uh, I work on this with uh, my co-chair for the district, Susan Chan, uh, who does a much better job with it than I do, uh, but she wasn't able to be here today. Uh, I hope she's watching. Uh, I'd like to encourage all of the clubs in the district to be involved with Youth Exchange uh, and to support Youth Exchange by encouraging the students in their area uh, to be involved uh, by sending students and also by receiving students into their club. Uh, we've got some wonderful students, uh, a current Youth Exchange student, a short-term exchange student that we've sent from Jonesboro and some students that we've hosted in the past uh, just to let everybody get a feel uh, for the students that uh, we've had. And so I'd like to introduce some of those today. Uh, Ethan uh, Lehman is a student uh, that is currently in Thailand. I don't see anything that would uh, show that he's in Thailand right now. So I could say he's in Antarctica, but we'll take his word that he's in Thailand right now. Uh, but we sent him uh, this year and I believe he'll be coming back uh, shortly in just a few weeks, uh, but he's currently in Thailand. He left from Little Rock uh, and he'll be coming back shortly. Uh, and he's a fantastic young man and he's going to receive, a, I believe, a Governor's Distinguished Scholarship and going to be attending uh, Fayetteville uh, this fall. But I'll let Ethan introduce himself. Yes, sir. Thank you, Vince. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, as you said, my name is Ethan Lehman. And although I don't have a flag in the back to display it, I am a Rotary Youth Exchange student in Thailand. Um, so uh, to talk a little bit about my exchange, uh, I chose Thailand because I have hosted Thai exchange students in the past. Uh, my grandparents hosted them, so I was always very familiar with Thai people and uh, a little bit of Thai culture, even since I was very, very young. And my mother actually uh, used to live in Bangkok for a couple years. Her father was in the military. So Thailand was always in the back of my head uh, as a place to travel. And once I heard about uh, Youth Exchange uh, with Rotary, I decided to seize the opportunity and here I am. So I moved here in August, August 5th, I believe. And I will be going home in a week. On July 5th, I leave Thailand. Uh, the exchange experience has been absolutely fantastic. I have been able to work very closely with my Rotary Club in Thailand, connect with people from all over my city in Thailand, and work with schools for uh, the kids, kids with special needs, and volunteer very closely with physicians uh, at the hospital. I'm a I'm a prospective prospective physician myself, and it, that's been a very wonderful opportunity to be able to connect with those people uh, through my through connections that my Rotary Club has. So that's wonderful. I've traveled to some more remote villages and taught about hygiene and administered uh, different or like volunteered and helped administer uh, various different uh, medications to people that may not have access to those things. So that has been a wonderful experience. That's just some of the things I've done uh, over here in Thailand. And uh, it's been it's been a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And I assume some of those experiences, Ethan, are not experiences that you would have been able to have in Little Rock. And I'm glad that Absolutely. you were able to have those experiences there. Uh, the next student that uh, we have is no longer a student. Uh, he was an exchange student into our district uh, from Brazil. He came to District 6150 from Brazil in 2010, 2011. Uh, Felipe Pubelli, uh, he was sponsored by the Rotary Club of Wynn and lived here uh, for a year. Uh, he has very good English. He's living in Brazil now. I believe he's a flight attendant uh, in Brazil and right. is going to tell us about his exchange. Uh, he was talking earlier. They were telling him they needed more light on his face because everyone wanted to see him. And I said he didn't hear that very often. Oh, and look, the light just yeah. Yeah, spot again. <laughs> So, well, Felipe. Hello, my name is Felipe. I'm, I'm from Brazil. I'm 27 years old. Um, I was a former inbound from Brazil. Uh, it's been 10 years, actually. 
Well, it's been a while. Well, um, I'm from a very, very, very small town in Brazil, around like 12,000 people. And the opportunity of being an exchange student in America changed my life literally forever. Um, it was so good for me because I could get out of my comfort zone. I could get to see another culture and all the different stuff. And the more important part, I think it's just you don't get to know the culture of the country you're going to. You actually meet so many people from all over the world and you literally became a um, global citizen. Uh, after I came back to Brazil, I entered college. I graduated as a mechanical engineering. And since I spoke very good English at the time, not anymore, sorry. <laughs> uh, I got a scholarship from the Brazilian government and I had the opportunity to live in England for a year. And being an exchange student before was super easy, super, super easy. Just go in there and adapt to a new place and a new culture. I could literally go anywhere and it was an amazing opportunity. I had very, very, very good embroidery from Vince. I lived with Vince at that time. And I, it just made me feel like home. I, I was home the whole time. That, that part of being like homesick away from home didn't hit me very much because I got all the support I needed from Rotary. And it changed my life forever. Like uh, there is no Felipe before the, ex the exchange anymore. It's just after that, a totally different person in a good way though. <laughs> well, that's great. I'm glad that your exchange uh, had a positive influence on your life. Uh, yeah. And uh, we appreciate having you. And so uh, the next uh, student that we're going to hear from, I believe is, if they're going to pull them up for me, I hope is Jose. Jose uh, Antonio Souza Dias. Uh, he was an exchange student from Brazil as well. Uh, he looks much older now with a beard. Uh, one of the things uh, that you couldn't tell from looking at Jose is that uh, he is a budding singer and he knows the lyrics to every song that was ever published. Uh, maybe he'll do a song for us while he's on uh, for us. But uh, Jose, tell us something about your exchange. Well, I went to the ex to exchange in the U.S. in 2013, 2014. And I learned a lot of good things in the U.S. Uh, and some things that I use even today. Like when I got to America, I wanted to be in med school and I wanted to be a heart doctor. Now I'm graduating law school and I believe that living with Vince had, a, had played a really important role in that changing subject. And he said that I know all the lyrics, but I'm not sure all of them, mainly the 80s, I guess. And I really like the exchange student, being an exchange student, because I had some really opportunities, really good opportunities that I didn't have back here. And in my family, it was a very common thing because we had received ex-students before, and even after I came back, my brother went in the year of 2017, 2018, went on like an exchange to the city of Waterloo in Illinois, in the U.S. So here in, in my house, it's a very important thing for all of us, the Rotary Youth Exchange Program. Well... Jose, I got to meet your brother as well, but I don't know that I want to take credit for you being a lawyer. I'm not sure many folks watching are going to say it's an improvement for you going to, from being a doctor to a lawyer. But I think that uh, anything that you want to be is a good thing uh, in the future. Uh, the next uh, student that we have uh, is Autumn Holland. Uh, she is, I believe, a senior in high school in Jones. What? Just graduated. So, yes. Just graduated. Uh, time gets away from me. Uh, <laughs> Autumn just graduated high school in Jonesboro. Um, and not only do I uh, 
make uh, matches for students to go on exchange. Uh, I make matches for students to uh, have dates to proms. And um, I think Autumn and Ethan went to prom together because I matched them up some way. Uh, I kind of embarrass folks and uh, I'll stop embarrassing, but Autumn. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh, look at that. They put everybody on the screen. Wow. Sam does Wait that. He didn't even know you. I was going to say that. Who's ever oh. moderating? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but Autumn went to Italy and uh, she went on a short term exchange. And so that's different than the year long exchange. But with the short term exchange, uh, the students. Uh, get to spend uh, four to six weeks in another country. And then the student that you stayed with came back to America and stayed with you, uh, which is a different experience. It's family to family. And uh, I even met her when I was at an old person's concert uh, that you like old people music uh, <laughs> and heard Goo Goo Dolls and Train. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your experience. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, so I hosted... So with the short time you also host and you're hosted. So I was hosted in Italy and I got to host who would be my host sister here. So when we ran into Vince at the concert, I actually had Benny with me and we took her to that concert. She thought it was really fun. So, but we like old people music, um, but it was super, super amazing having Benny here. We got to show her like what our life was like. She was here for the 4th of July, which was the most American day of the year, which was super fun. Um, for her to be able to experience for us to show her and then I went to Italy I was there for about a month so um, a lot different than what the long-term exchange students are used to but it was super amazing because I lived with so my host family it was four siblings four sisters and I have three sisters here so I was used to like the kind of chaos and it was just like my family away from home and it was super super amazing to get to um, experience their life there we traveled around for a little bit they lived in Milan but I got to experience, they had like family homes um, up in the mountains and by the coast. So I got to experience both of those, those three different ways of life um, while in Italy. And that was super amazing. Um, I wasn't able to become fluent in Italian while I was there, um, but I wasn't there um, long enough to become fluent in that. But I did learn the basics and it was super cool to see how easy it was to pick up on the language after you were there for just a few weeks. Um, though I couldn't speak it very well, I did understand quite a bit more than I was expecting to. And it was super, super cool to get to see like the way that their family interacted with each other and the way that we interacted with Benny while she was here. Um, but it was a super amazing experience and it definitely changed like the way that I saw the world in many ways. And it made me become much more independent in everything that I did. And um, yeah, it was an amazing experience and I'm super, super happy that I was able to do it. Um, I wish that anybody could be able to have this experience that wants it. And I'm super glad that Rotary was able to let me do this. So was the best part of your exchange, your actual exchange or going to the prom with Ethan? <laughs> Definitely the exchange. Um, oh, okay. I <laughs> won't ask you. <laughs> while we had fun both places. It was, yeah. But I'm All super right. thankful for the community that we've created through Rotary and I love it. All right. And I'm not sure if there is one more person. Do we have any more? Oh, there we are. And so uh, I think we're going to have Hatton Weeks come on. Uh, I think we've got the best program in all of Rotary with Youth Exchange. Uh, and I will let Hatton take over. Thank you, uh, Vince. And unlike Vince, uh, I'm, uh, I'd like to start with Ethan, and I'm not going to bring up the fact that you were able to land a date with Autumn to prom. I'm not going to bring it up. And Much appreciated. I, <laughs> and I, I start with you, Ethan, because you have the most interesting experience right now, maybe of anybody. You are overseas, have been overseas since August, and um, started uh, in the, the quarantine. The pandemic started while you were overseas. Tell us what that experience is like for you overseas in, in Thailand. Absolutely. So in Thailand, we didn't actually get hit uh, with a, a large number of COVID cases. We were the first country outside of China that was infected, but it was a very slow trickle. And uh, Thailand does a very good job as, as a country to contain and uh, the virus. And a lot of people wear masks. So it wasn't as frightening from a safety perspective. However, it did affect the quality of life for sure, like of my exchange. Not to say that 
you know, staying at home with my family all day is bad, but I wasn't able to go out, right? So it was different, but uh, on the bright side of things, I was able to get a lot closer with my host family. And I think that was like such, such a benefit of being at home the whole time. You know, we would share every meal together, of course, um, and my host sisters teach me Thai. It was, it was, very, it was very good. We, I'm a lot closer with my host family because of the pandemic, because I was not able to go anywhere. And now it's actually clearing up uh, quite a bit. From a number standpoint, it is clearing up and things are opening up. So I'm able to go out and my host family has taken me to multiple different places. And just the fact that I was able to build that relationship, it really means a lot to me. Um, dis despite the, the bad circumstances everywhere else, uh, to build that relationship was absolutely wonderful. That, you know, that's great to hear. And Ethan, we... I think in many homes and communities across the United States, I think we're seeing the same thing as families are forced together. We, we, we reconnect, if you will, because we, uh, we were quarantined and forced to. Um, next question here is uh, for Felipe. And um, you, uh, you grew up in a small town, you said, of 12,000 people in Brazil, which across the 6150 uh, district footprint is actually a pretty large town. Uh, but you uh, you were in um, you spent a year in Wynn. Yeah. Tell me about some of the similarities from your hometown in Brazil to uh, the city of Wynn here in Arkansas. Well, I think the only thing that's actually similar is that everyone knows each other because the rest is totally different. Um, a small town in Brazil, you don't have many stuff to do. Although people when said they didn't have many stuff to do, but they have like great restaurants. They had like a great supermarket but in brazil it's totally different so for me like going when i saw that i was going to a small town i was like oh my god again but it was completely different from what i expected actually much much better than i expected it was completely different <laughs> next question here is uh for uh jose uh you were here in 2013 2014 and um while you were here uh, you arrived wanting to be a doctor, and you left wanting to go to law school. What was that spark of change for you? I don't know. I guess the living a different way that I used to live here made me have some another view of the world that I didn't have before, and I learned different things. That when I put arrived back here, that was time to go to college that was w the thing that i wanted to do and then i started law school in 2015 and i i graduate this year if if we, everything ends up well well and, and we know it will and we know it will so um next question here for autumn and again i'm not going to bring up the fact that you went to prom with ethan um just curious, you, your time in Italy. What was the biggest? Um, what was the most interesting thing that you um, that you saw that you realized while you were overseas in Italy? Hmm. Okay, let me think real quick. Oh, one day it was like um, my host sisters all had tutoring, and my other host sister had to babysit. So everyone was out of the house, and my host mom was just home doing laundry. And she's like, "If you'd like to go out um, to visit the city, just go ahead." And I was like, "All right." So she gave me written directions to the Milan Cathedral. And I just wandered through the city until I found the cathedral. And it was amazing. Like, I got a little lost on the way there with the written directions. But <laughs> it was super fun to kind of just get lost in the city where I didn't know half the language. I didn't know hardly anything. But it was really, really amazing to get to just stumble upon the cathedral. And that was so cool. Let me um, let me back up here and ask a couple of questions for either Jose or, or Felipe because you're you're overseas now, and it's a similar question to what I asked Ethan earlier. Um, how are you dealing with the coronavirus pandemic? What is it like where you're at? And and um, are, are people wearing masks? Are things opening back up? And I'll ask that of, of either one of you. Okay, do you want to talk? <laughs> we'll go first. <laughs> Well, in my city, we are, we have to wear ma masks everywhere we go, but we are working as normal. I work every day, all day long, and there was n no big changes in that side. Well, uh, 
to be kind of honest, like Brazil is a huge country, not as big as America, but it's very big too. And the virus hit different regions and different timings. So the place where I live right now, I'm from the same state as yes, the place I live right now at the top of the curve. No, it's just going down. But some other places in Brazil, the the curve is going up and there are a lot of new cases and deaths. But I actually stopped working for two months because I didn't have anything to do. I stopped and I just got back this month. But I think it's most of the states here, they're, they have like uh, regulations to wear masks in public and people are trying to take care. But wow, that's it. Let, let me bounce back to Autumn here for a moment. Um, if there is someone who is considering participating either as a host or uh, wanting to go overseas, what would be the biggest piece of advice you could give someone? What would be the, the one selling point you would tell them? I say just do it. Like, there's a big part of me that's always like, just jump into like the unknown, which I think is always a great thing. You know, with safety, of course, but like with rotary, there's, there's really nothing that, nothing really that could go that wrong. <laughs> so just go for it. And Ethan, I'll ask you, uh, you're overseas now. What would be the biggest, the one selling point you would tell a, uh, a family looking to host or someone wanting to participate? All right, um, a family wanting to host. I think the hosting experience is is much more much more uh, interesting for the for the parents. Uh, absolutely, um, and being able to teach some of your own culture things that maybe come naturally to you, something that you learned as a little kid uh, that maybe you've never had to teach another person. Uh, that that's a very interesting experience when I've had an exchange student close to me, and something that I would tell somebody that wants to go on exchange is that there's absolutely nothing like it. You can't recreate the feeling, the feelings that you get, whether it be like being lost somewhere or not knowing how to communicate it very well. And you can go travel for a short period of time, but being on exchange and growing as much as you can uh, as a person, that's absolutely one of a kind experience. That's a great, great place to leave it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, participating. Thank you for either visiting or, or uh, are going overseas and spending your time. Amazing experience that you have that'll last a lifetime. And thank you, Vince Guest, for uh, leading uh, the the best program in all of uh, all of Rotary. So uh, thank you to everybody. Uh, one of our panelists, Matthew Kobleski from uh, France, had a prior commitment today. Um, he did the record a short video telling us about his exchange experience in District 6150 back in 2014, 2015, and how it's continued to affect his life and how the exchange program can positively affect your local club. Here's his story. Bonjour. My name is Matt. I live in Besançon, France, where I study my master degrees for economics, management, and international businesses. Six years ago, I was about to leave my friends and my family to go and live in Arkansas as an exchange student. At this time, I was 15 years old. I wasn't able to realize that this opportunity would have such an impact on me even a few years later. I knew that I would get some great benefits, uh, short-term benefits, such as learning English, make friends, discover a new culture, uh, thanks to the family, the host families, and the other exchange students. The biggest outcomes just they came, they came after my exchange. And I, that's the thing I didn't realize at this time. And it's really powerful. For example, the ability to learn and speak English enabled me to access so much content, videos, books, whatever, and get internship, boost my resume. A few months after my return, I found a job and I don't think I would have wanted to get a job at this time. My family and friends noticed a change. I, I would say I evolved. Before my exchange, I had no self-confidence and now I'm able to speak to you on the camera and I make some videos on YouTube and now I know people from all over the world and these connections are very valuable in the future for business or for example just even travel. Hosting student is a great experiment that I would recommend for anyone. You'll be impressed 
how much you can learn from an exchange student. And most of the time you make a great connection. Uh, it's a strong bond between the student and the family. I, I still keep in touch with my families, my host families. Okay, I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, I just want to say firstly, thank you so much for hosting exchange student. You're just like some kind of heroes for us, really. I mean it. Being an exchange student initiated so much things in my life, good changes. And if it wasn't for the Rotarians, I'm 100% sure that I wouldn't be where I am today. So thank you to all of you. And secondly, if you have the opportunity to be an exchange student, to encourage your son or daughter to be one, or to even host an exchange student, I would say don't hesitate. Don't hesitate at all. It's a very valuable experiment for you, for, for everyone. It's, it's a win-win game, I, I, I would call it. So thank you for watching. I'm sorry I couldn't be there today to speak with you, but uh, I joined the military, French military reserve, and so we are preparing a mission, so sorry. Oh, oh, oh and one more thing, uh, you know, because there is always good and bad and bad and good. You know? the, the downside um, is that you don't know how to make bread and that's a tragedy for you. And it was for me. I mean, I missed bread so much. Um, but you have great donuts and pancakes and stuff. But look, here. Mmm, so good. All right, I'm getting lost. But thanks for listening to me and have a great day. Bye. Oh my goodness, nothing like a little bit of levity and uh, envy too, as he shared his love of bread virtually. It's so impressive to hear the incredible work that these young people are doing. And a lot of it probably is in their DNA, but certainly uh, it has not lost the impact, the significant impact that Rotarians have had on these young people's lives. And one of the things that struck me when we were listening to them speak was talking about expanding the worldview, their worldview. So it's certainly an opportunity to continue to do that. And we want to take just a minute to give a couple of shout outs to some folks who are watching via Facebook and YouTube. We've seen folks from Kentucky, Stuttgart, Osceola, and Paragul checking in. And we want to remind you that you have an opportunity to leave a comment and connect with your friends or make some new friends. And if you have questions for any of our panelists, this is your time to do so as well. A question from Tyler Dunnigan to Vince, although Vince is not on screen with us now. Uh, Tyler wants to know, Vince, when did the Goo Goo Dolls become old people music? <laughs> Something to think about. We're going to transition now and move into the membership portion of our conversation today. You know, Rotary is an organization with 1.2 million neighbors, friends, leaders, and problem solvers who see a world where people unite, but they don't just unite. They take action. So we consider our membership a gift, and we're always looking for ways to share this gift, the gift that keeps on giving, right? In this next area, these clubs will share their perspectives and their experiences. Please help us welcome now Michelle Oglesby, membership chair and president-elect of the Rotary Club of Sherwood. Hi, Michelle. Hi there. Also, Kevin Jumper, who is the vice president of the Rotary Club of Forest City. Mr. Oh. Charles Harris, who is the president of the Rotary Club of Little Rock Metro. And this one has piqued my interest when I heard about the title, because it sounds like they're just a really, not that you guys aren't cool, but this next group sounds really cool, uh, representing the president-elect of the Rotary Club of Little Rock After Hours. That means you can get Rotary work done any time of the day or night. Please welcome Mr. Matt Bowie. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Pamela. Thank you. And I guess we'll start with uh, Mr. Hatton asking some fantastic questions after we hear from Michelle. You want to kick it off for us? 
Hi, I am Michelle Oglesby, and um, I am so happy to be here. Uh, when our president asked us, how can we grow membership or how many people do we think we can get in our club? Uh, we all agreed on 50. So I came up with a campaign of the road to 50 and I utilized the rotary membership tools that they offer. I also uh, gave each of our uh, members invitations everybody loved invitations so to personalize it we had them to send out invitations to people that they think that will be the good uh rotarians we also everywhere we go we pass out our brochures so people can know what rotary is and then we also uh, had a membership event where people could come in ask questions and find out about rotary and I love pens, as you can see. So we encourage, well, I encourage our, our members to wear their pens uh, through a challenge. And that way it's a good conversation starter because people will wanna know, well, what do those pens represent? So when you have something on, people are gonna ask questions. So uh, we went from 34 to 45, even through Zoom, we um, inducted four members through Zoom, and we also had someone to even come to Zoom, and we inducted that person last Tuesday at our installation celebration. So it's uh, we have various ways of inviting people, letting people know what Rotary does, and so that's how we became successful. So we didn't quite make our 50. We, we're at 45, but the journey continues. Thank you, Michelle. What a, a great way to get us kicked off talking about membership. It can be accomplished even virtually. Mr. Yeah. Jumper? Yes, I'm Kevin Jumper, and I am uh, will be the president-elect coming up uh, this coming year for the Rotary Club of Forest City. Uh, you're getting me because I was kind of the only one that was available, so I'm sorry you're not getting the best of the membership group, but I can tell you there's two things that we did the start of the year that caused the increase in membership. One, we started out with an appreciation for first responders and we asked members of our law enforcement firefighters and other first responders to come and, uh, and we provided uh, their meals and so forth uh, for those that could come each week. And then that led to some growth and activity in the fund, uh, in the group. And then also the second thing we targeted um, female and minority uh, business uh, members of the community to come. And so we had a record number of minority memberships and female memberships in the club this year. And so those things combined uh, is what well, we got the benefit of growth for this year, which was really good for us. We had been kind of sagging for several years, but uh, hopefully that's led to permanent revitalization for us. Well, thank you for sharing that as well. And by the way, Brian Rega says, awesome shirt, go Cubbies to you, <laughs> Kevin. Go Cubs. <laughs> thank you. Let's check in now with uh, Mr. Harris. Good morning, uh, fellow Rotarians, and greetings from the Little Rock Metro Rotary Club, the breakfast club of Little Rock, the club to wake up with. <laughs> so we are excited about this opportunity to share with you uh, about our club and our accomplishments. Uh, we experienced a 45% plus growth this uh, year, and uh, we are excited about that. That was very needed to uh, ensure the long-term sustainability of our small group. Uh, we started out with 11. We ended up with 16 at the end of the year. And even more importantly, uh, the six individuals that we recruited, uh, uh, inducted into the organization, uh, transformed our club dem demographics. Uh, we went from 19% uh, female to, excuse me, from 9% female to 19% female, from 18% uh, uh, African Americans to 31%. And our uh, demographics age-wise changed uh, quite a bit. Uh, we started out where we were 82%, 60 and over, and now uh, we are 37%, uh, 50 and under. So we are we are we are excited about that because that will certainly in, in to, uh, ensure the long-term sustainability of our, our organization. Uh, we just followed the 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 the. the 
format that was given to us in terms of uh, assessing where we are and where we want to go and then come up with a plan to bridge the difference. And uh, uh, the strength that we identified, us being a small club and everyone told us was our, our intimacy and uh, friendliness. And so we built up on that and we work with our membership, you know, to say, let's just make sure we invite people here. And when we get here, they experience us. And uh, that was the thing that uh, won, won many people over who came to visit with us. Thank you very much. It just goes to show that no matter the age, it's just cool to be a part of the Rotary Club. It's doing great works, so no matter the age, gender, or uh, background. So thank you for sharing. We're going to have our last comments from Mr. Bowie. And then after Mr. Bowie visits with us, Pat, why don't you take it over and get the Q&A started? Thanks, Pamela. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, if, if I may tag on to uh, uh, President uh, Harris's, if, if uh, the morning club is the, the club you wake up with, uh, the after hours club, the, the newest club in District 6150, we're the, we're the club you can spend your evenings with. Uh, as Pamela was alluding to a moment ago, after hours is, uh, it's a new concept. Uh, Rotary has uh, talked about having flexible clubs, which is a, a, a new idea for Rotary. You know, traditional Rotary clubs are built around, you know, uh, uh, once a week meetings, either during the lunch or, or, or morning time hours. Our club is built around having our meetings and activities after hours, as the name implies. Uh, it, it all got started back in uh, March of 2019, actually well before that in the planning. A partnership with uh, the West Little Rock Rotary Club, uh, led by past uh, District Governor Nancy Lenhart and past President Stephanie Shine, along with District 6150 and District Governor at the time, John Deacon. So the desire to have this flexible club actually came to fruition. So from a membership perspective, uh, the idea really started out as the after hours concept being really a, a satellite club of the West Little Rock uh, Club. So they were thinking uh, initially, gosh, if we could get eight members to participate in this after hours concept, they, that it would be a success. Well, turns out it was a really, really good idea. In just one year, in just one year, we went from hoping to have eight members to over 60, 60 people who were not engaged in Rotary. So it's a great concept, flexible, after hours, uh, uh, non-traditional, but it, we've found a way to reach out to the community and really bring in new members for Rotary. Well, now that we have the whole panel here, I will start with uh, Michelle Oglesby. And Michelle, you um, you sent out invitations. Everybody's wearing pins. You have the challenge, the brochures. You're getting the name of Rotary and uh, and, and everything that goes with it out there. What was the? What do you think you had the most success with in everything you did? Well, I forgot to mention that we do Facebook Live. So I think that's the main thing uh, because we not only do we videotape our meetings, but we also videotape our projects and so forth. So people can go on e either Facebook or Instagram. So social media is a big plus. And that way they can see how much fun we're having because I'm all about fun. And so they are interested in that. So it's just kind of a, a, a combined effort on using the invitations and, and of course, asking people, are they interested? And then being proud of your, your club and what you're accomplishing is because all, all of it is just trying to connect making people have fun and enjoy the community. That's awesome. Uh, Kevin, um, you, uh, you mentioned uh, first responders were invited, uh, fed them for free, which is always nice. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But you had a, 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 you're a far more diverse club than you were a year ago. And I'm, I am uh, uh, just curious, how has that changed the, the club there in Forest City for the better? Well, it's, uh, we've had an increased participation in the programs that we did have, and so we've been able to be, just be better at our programs and reaching more people and more ideas and, um, and looking ahead for just new programs and new, and new procedures and so forth. Uh, it's been a breath of fresh air for us. 
that is great to hear. And and Charles, same question with not only an increase in diversity, but you you may have hit a magic bullet here in the fact that you have a much younger demographic than you did a year ago. How has that changed the dynamics of of the uh, of the club? Uh, yes, having 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 a, a, a club that reflects more the community in which we reside and the different age groups and demographics uh, around that has made it a much more interesting place to be. Again, we emphasize that the that the thing our, our, our number one thing we said uh, that people tell us when they come there is that when we come there. It just feels so friendly. We feel at home, etc. So we structure our meetings around making sure we give people an opportunity to interact with each other, get to know each other, especially uh, any uh, our visitors, etc. Around that way, and it's uh, it's just brought new energy and life to the club. That's great to hear. And you know, Matt, he he has a younger demographic, which I would think would you know maybe want to go for an after hours club. What's what's the demographic of of, of your uh, club? I think you're muted. Sorry about that. There you go. Yeah, great, great question, Hatton. Yeah, actually, our, our demographic is is rather young. Uh, and in fact, uh, about 56% of our membership uh, is uh, below the age of, uh, uh, of 50, and, and almost 40% is below the age of 40. So you have a, a, a very young club. We actually also have a very uh, high percentage of uh, uh, females in our club as well, which we're very, very proud of. We have uh, over over 53% of our club membership is, is female. So that brings uh, a, a tremendous, uh, uh, vibrant, uh, dynamic uh, uh, to our group, which we're very proud of. That is great. And and Matt, I'll stay with you since your mic is unmuted. As we look forward for the next year and we continue to grow our Rotary Clubs locally, uh, what's the big focus moving forward for you in terms of gaining members? Yeah, great question, Hatton. The, the big focus for us next year is, is going to be uh, to really kind of continue what we've started this year. We're, we're a brand new club. We've had a lot of uh, early uh, uh, startup activities, of course, with, with COVID-19. That's kind of put a damper on a lot of things, but we're going to continue our online video conferencing. We're going to continue to, where possible, have service projects uh, out and about where we can still gather members together in small groups if possible. We're going to continue to have social activities, again, where possible, where uh, the, the health guidelines allow to bring our membership together and continue to outreach into the community to, uh, to reach out and, and bring in those people who may not have uh, considered Rotary uh, in a uh, traditional sense otherwise. And uh, I'll ask the same question of Charles. What is going to be the, the big focus for gaining members for you in the coming year? Well, the first thing uh, for us is to make sure we retain the ones that we got. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, and and so everybody has their circle of, of influence. And what we uh, we influence people to do is, is that when you come in, we, we, we make sure that we get them involved, et cetera. And we keep emphasizing uh, uh, talk to other. We got a we got a we got a jewel here that a lot of other folks need to know about that can help our community as well as help the people who join uh, as a part of that. And we do something like we 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 have a pic, picture board that we post uh, on the uh, online. And each time we meet, we have all our members there. And every time a new member is added, we, we put that picture up there and we have what our goal is a blank spot and we say new members on the way. So we try to keep that energy, et cetera, around there and make sure our programming is something that also involves that. You, uh, you know, Mr. Harris, uh, retention is uh, very important, and I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, Kevin, uh, same question for you. What uh, What is something you, your uh, clubs are doing there to, to garner viewer or garner uh, people in the in the coming year? Well, I hate to tell you, I'm the wrong person to ask that. I'm not on the <laughs> membership committee. I'm just the one that's available. Uh, I mean, you know, COVID-19 gave us some challenges that I don't know if we've just conquered that yet, but our, we're certainly hoping to keep what we've done, what we've done before that's worked, uh, keep involving, uh, involving our first responders. And that's allowing us to reach a younger, uh, expose younger 
uh, residents in the community to Rotary. And uh, I think that's going to lead into a lot more results for us, too. Absolutely. And they will go tell their friends they uh, they had lunch at Rotary and uh, ask, what is that? Who is that? That's a great uh, great way to um, uh, to get folks interested in Rotary membership. And Michelle, I'll, I'll end with you in the same question. What are you going to be working on in the coming year to, to garner new members? Well, being more visible um, and definitely uh, <clears throat> involved in the younger group as well. And uh, just let people know that we are here. We are here to help. Uh, be more visible in our community, partner with the chamber, and uh, have fun. That's what it's all about is having fun and helping people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'd like to thank the panel, everybody, for uh, what you have been able to do over uh, the course of the year to garner new members for Rotary and excited for um, uh, the future as we go. So thank you very much, and I'll thank turn you. it back over to Pamela. Thank you, Haddon and membership team. I'm so excited to hear all of the great work that they are doing. And aren't they just the greatest panel? They're all so happy and smiling. Who couldn't be excited about this virtual conference today? Right, Haddon? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we need to give a couple more shout outs because people are definitely tuning in virtually. And we're so excited to see you here today. Debbie Davis says there's a nice group of Rotarians from the Lawrence County Club watching uh, as a group. So thank you all and thank you for saying hello and checking in. We're happy that you are joining us. And Nancy Leonhardt says, way to go, Little Rock Metro. So everybody is saying hello and, and giving you guys shout outs virtually. They're saying they're enjoying watching this District 6150 conference. And you know, the neat thing about this is you heard the membership uh, efforts that are underway. You can steal some of these ideas and hopefully uh, they will work for you as well. We're going to continue with our wonderful program this afternoon. And I hope you're jotting down some good notes so that uh, you'll have some some pearls of uh, wisdom to discuss when you get back together with your respective clubs. But right now we're going to ask our district governor, Mr. George Frey, to join us again with a very special memorial. Hello again, Mr. Frey, Governor Frey, excuse me. We want to pause at this time to remember the Rotarians and friends that have passed away during this Rotary year. We have lost some very talented Rotarians, three of them being past district governors. Uh, so please join me at this time as we honor these that have passed away. hear my father's voice he would tell me to move on he would say I'll be just fine yeah he would tell me we have time time to laugh and time to heal a favorite song is on repeat drinking wine until the dawn
Governor Frey, this is for you. Go where the is free, we won't be fooled. We're socially distancing in miracle. We can't get together in a degree. But the district conference will still go on thanks to this thing calls in. And it will be a winner, this we can say. Under the leadership of Governor Frey, we're a little bit short of our six foot space, so let us give us some district conference. Here we come. One more time. COVID has got us, we won't be fooled. We're socially distancing in Paragool. We can't get together in a rally group, but the district conference will still go on. Thanks to this thing calls in. And it will be a winner, this we can say. Under the leadership of Governor Frank, we're a little bit short of our sixth place, so let us get us some district conference. Here we come. Thank you. And as we can see and hear, our Rotarians are a talented bunch of uh, wonderful people. So we enjoyed that presentation from our Paragold Rotarians. Thank you very much. And you can give them a virtual hand clap. The Rotary Foundation was created over 100 years ago. And during this time, it has spent over $4 billion. Can you imagine that number? $4 billion with the B dollars on life-changing sustainable projects that have changed communities all around the world. The mission of the Rotary Foundation is to enable Rotarians to advance world understanding, goodwill, and peace through the improvement of health, the support of education, and the alleviation of poverty. Please help us welcome now Mr. Mike Shelton, who is the current president of the Rotary Club of Lawrence County. As a polio survivor, Rotary's mission to eradicate polio around the world is especially important to him. Hello to you, Mr. Shelton. And unmute your mic, there you go. Mr. Shelton, if you could unmute your mic, we'd love to hear you. Well, while we are awaiting Mr. Shelton's there, there's Mr. Carter. So hello, Mr. Carter, Mr. Well, John Carter. He is the past district governor. Of, uh, he continues to serve the district as a district foundation chair and his club, the Rotary Club of Sherwood. So uh, Mr. Carter, thank you for joining us while we uh, wait the return of Mr. Shelton. Thank you. Here we go. I have some slides that were prepared and I just kind of want to talk about these. I'm going to give you a brief, very brief overview of what the foundation is. So if we start, Sam, next slide. And again, the uh, Rotary Foundation has several many, many programs in Polio Plus. Rotary Peace Centers, district grants and global grants are just a few of them. I want you to notice on the right, there is four stars. It says Charity Navigator, and that is a firm that sole business is to rate charities. And they rate them on how good a job they do in the transparency. Four stars is their highest rating, and Rotary Foundation was just awarded two months ago, I believe. The four-star rating for the 12th year in a row. And below that, you see a figure of 92%. And that represents the amount of money out of your dollar that goes to a project. So 92 cents out of every dollar you give goes to a project. And I will challenge you to find a charity that does a better job. Next. These are just different things about the foundation. So many of you have heard of EREY, which stands obviously for every Rotarian every year. And that, again, is just a Rotarian that gives something every year to the foundation, whether it's a dollar or a thousand dollars, they give something every year. A sustaining member is someone who gives annually at least a hundred dollars a year. 
Our, our district goal is that every club have $100 per capita every year. And below that, in the, the end of May, which won't be the final numbers, there were five clubs that have already done that. And you can see them listed there. Next. Now, Pam was talking about polio. I know Mike's going to get on in a minute and tell his personal story. But you know, we've been fighting polio for over 30 years. It's our number one objective in Rotary. And about, oh, in 14, I believe, uh, we started having a world polio day and that's october 24th every year and it just is simply a day that we recognize as rotarians and hopefully in our clubs to think about polio to have polio programs to have fundraisers to make polio aware in our own community uh you can see that last figure that uh i think that's does it give the year i'm sorry in 14 in one year, we did over $209,000 on that day. Next. Uh, this is Rodeo Club of Sherwood. We had a program about rodeo, uh, rodeo, about polio, and then we did a purple finger, finger painting at the end of the meeting. Next. Uh, the Rotary Club of Batesville had a showing of a movie called Breathe, which is about a polio survivor and uh, to make the club and the community aware of about polio. Next. And that's another picture of the base. We can see the people in the, in the seats and then they had a booth outside the, in the lobby. Next. Rotary Club at Jonesboro, they actually had the ASU clock tower lit up in purple to give recognition about polio to the whole community. And again, at their club meeting, they painted their pinkies purple next so again the world polio day is about one day and one focus to end polio uh the rotary club of blival had a uh, doctor talk about the polio virus and then they had a polio survivor talk to the club next we also you know that we recognize people that give to the uh, foundation and a Paul Harris fellow is someone that uh, has given $100 over their Rotary career, and they become a Paul Harris fellow. But the Paul Harris Society is made up of members that have actually pledged to give $1,000 a year. And we have now had over 72 people in our own district that have made that commitment. That is, there is Greg Marler presenting a Paul Harris Society certificate to one of his members. Next. This is amazing. Uh, the Rotary Club of Jonesboro during the year inducted 71 new Paul Harris fellows and at that time became a 100% Paul Harris fellow club. That is a very difficult and unique designation. That means every member in the club at that time is a Paul Harris fellow. And I believe that makes them the fourth club to do that. And uh, Hughes also did the same thing with the club, Rotary Club Hughes this year. Next. Uh, when you have a Rotary Club fellow in your club, make a presentation out of it. Stand them up, recognize them, and thank them. They've made a commitment to the foundation. Next. Now, every year for the last, I don't know, several years, we have had an annual foundation banquet that has been held in Little Rock. We have a great speaker, usually a Rotary speaker. Uh, members from all over the district gather. It's a great event. It's a nice event where we can see our friends and see good speakers and, and meet unique people. Our speaker last year was Julia Phelps, and she is a Rotary Foundation trustee or past now. Uh, a very pleasant person. We got to know her over a course of about three days, and I now consider her a friend. But we learned when Julia was here that she's actually a native of Arkansas, grew up here, and then came back to Fayetteville to graduate U of A. So, uh, We've heard her call the hogs before. Next. And you can just, these are just tables that uh, clubs in, that paid it at, at the foundation. They're just snapshots of that. Sam, you can just roll through those.
uh, this is a QR code. You take your phone and hold it up to it. It'll take you right to the Rotary.org donate. So you can do it right now on your phone. And quite honestly, we could use your help. Uh, my attempts at raising money for the foundation came to a stop basically in March. I just didn't feel right about going out and asking people for money in that during those times. Uh, when we're all dealing with COVID right now, but we could really use your help. Uh, go ahead, Sam. Mm -hmm. This is simply a contact list. Uh, the people, I am the foundation chair. Dana Holmes is in charge of district grants and Darlene Andrews works with her. Dr. Jennifer Delahay is our Polio Plus chair and she is willing to go to any club and speak to them about polio. Now she is a little busy with COVID right now. I don't know how what her schedule looks like. Uh, and Dr. Bob Warner is in charge of our international if you have any question about Rotary, you can check, you can click on any one of those, choose any one of those people, or just contact me with anything you may want to know. Next. And I believe we're going to do questions and answers now. Thank you, John, for that awesome presentation. And that slide says it all, doing good in the world. But, John, we want you to hang with us because we... We'll do Q&A in just a minute, but right now we're going to hear from Mike, and then Mr. Hatton Weeks will join us and do the Q&A for us. Thanks so much for staying with us. Mr. Shelton, glad to see you and hear you now. Well, thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hello. I am Mike Shelton and current president of Rotary Club of Lawrence County. If I get emotional, please bear with me because it is. Today, I want to share with you some profound feelings I have about Rotary. I consider it a privilege to be a member of Rotary, especially because it's an organization that has made it a priority for over three decades to eradicate polio. I am a polio survivor. Since I was born before the discovery of polio vaccine by Jonas Salk, I know first <clears throat> Hand something about the fear and dread of polio. I have lived with the after effect of polio since I was 15 months old. Without the dedication and effort of people and organizations such as Rotary, polio still might be a, a threat because of Rotary Foundation's strong commitment, we are this close to eradicating polio. <clears throat> However, as long as there is a possibility of even one child contracting polio, we are so this close for another outbreak. Rotary is definitely an organization that I am proud to be a part of and be able to help continue the fight. I want to encourage each of you to do the same and to always be a part of this effort. Last year during Royal Polio Day, I challenged each Rotary Club in our district and each individual president to make a contribution to Rotary Foundation for In Polio Now. Today, I want to renew that challenge. Please continue to support the Foundation and effort to eradicate polio. Rotary Foundation and Polio Plus has proven that no problem is too big. Two of the three strands of the polio virus has been eradicated. Together, we must fight to end this terrible disease. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. We're going to uh, ask Mr. Hatton Weeks to join us now to conduct Q&A with Mr. Carter and Mr. Shelton. We appreciate Mr. Shelton sharing his very powerful personal testimony and more about the important work that we're Rotarians continue to do to support that great and worthy cause. Hatton? Thank you, Pamela. And, um, you know, John, uh, you, you walked through the presentation, how much money we're able to raise this year, and you see Mr. Shelton's story, and it hits home right here in the district that polio, its effects are still being felt across uh, our country and our world. And a lot of times it seems so foreign where we drop a dollar in the bucket or we donate to Rotary and 
it's going to a big cause somewhere else. Um, but that money has a real impact. Can you can you walk us through? I drop a dollar in that bucket of the Rotary Club of Jonesboro. Tell me some of the uh, how that money gets to where it needs to go. What are some of the programs that you know of that our money here in Arkansas is is supporting? Uh, thank you, Hatton. I want to back up just a minute. First, I'd like to thank you, Hatton, because part of Rotary is using our skills and our vocation to help others. And you have certainly done it in this troubling time to keep this district together. And I appreciate it very much. So I want to thank you for Thank you. And you talk about what the foundation does. And you're right. Some of these stories, you have to make a personal connection. And there's no powerful, more powerful personal connection than what we just heard from Mike. Those are the personal stories that make you want to reach into your pocket and know that you're doing good. But that dollar that you gave in Jonesboro could be going anywhere in the world. It could be going to a water project that we're partners with in Brazil. Uh, it can be going to uh, the heart to heart project that we're partners with in Mexico. It could be going to uh, what our own district has been deeply involved with for about 10 years, and that is funding Clinton scholars to come over here and study for two years and get a, a master's degree in peace and conflict resolution and good gosh if one of them comes out and does what we know having met them any of them could do it would be remarkable and it would be wonderful but those are the types of stories that you just need to hear to realize that i may not be able to do much but i can put that dollar in the bucket and i know it would do good around the world you know, and, and that's something we haven't been able to do since March is put a dollar in a bucket at a rotary meeting with a full stop coming uh, uh, with the coronavirus. How has that changed our fundraising efforts? How how are, have we moved, I, I assume, online? And, and how have fundraising efforts been since this pandemic started? Well, I, I mentioned it briefly. And obviously, when clubs shut down, uh, many clubs still depend entirely upon collecting money at the from their members at the club and it's in the foundation or whatever project they want. And that stopped. I mean, even though now my own club is meeting online and we still do happy dollars, it's awful hard to get the happy dollar through that Zoom camera somehow. So it's not really working. Uh, I have been, you know, get on my soapbox. I've been preaching for a long time that the best way to give is to go to rotary.org and sign up electronically and have just make a, a donation, whether it's one time, or if you want to give $100 a year, you can sign up and do $10 a month. I don't think you're going to miss it. Uh, I'm, as a Paul Harris Society coordinator, I say it's a lot of money, but it's only $85 a month, and we don't really miss that, you know. It's just a commitment to do something. And these times, you know, everybody's doing electronic payments. I mean, pay the church that way now. I pay my college that way now. I mean, everything's electronic. We need to move people into that realm. But more than that we you know in rotary is about stories it's about uh, somebody tugging at their heart to give that dollar and and we're not really getting that right now so money the giving is down money is down and and unfortunately that's going to hurt our district in three years because that's when the money comes back to the district that's right that's right uh, mr shelton i i uh, as a polio survivor when you tell someone I, I'm a polio survivor, do you, I, I would assume you get strange looks from time to time because we it, it's eradicated in this country and, and almost almost the world. But when you tell someone that you're a polio survivor and they and they look at you rather precariously, what what do you tell them? Well, uh, most of the time, you know, you don't get very many questions about it. You just get looks you know, walking down the street, especially from children. Uh, but uh, I, there's a lot of good sides to polio, and there's a lot of bad sides to it. Uh, naturally, the, I, I, uh, I think of the good side. I think of the things that uh, I've been blessed with. And uh, <clears throat> some questions are just hard to answer. Uh, but... Uh, you know, the, about the only thing you, you know you can tell them is is about the disease and, and uh, what causes, uh, especially because you know kids they just don't understand it these days. Uh, I, I, I even nurses 
in hospitals, young nurses, and I'm talking young nurses. Uh, I was in the hospital the first year, and I'd ask them, I said, do you know, do you know what polio is? And they looked at me kind of dumbfounded. Polio, what's that? Now, I'm talking nurse. And it, it's, it's a past history that has been forgotten. Now, you take today's coronavirus, uh, will it be remembered 20 years from now? Who knows? You know, but uh, but again, I just want to stress the fact that you know we're we're this close to eradicating it, but we are this close for another epidemic as long as one can get it, uh, it, it even even if it's in a faraway country. And uh, if if I'm not stepping out of bounds, I do want to mention that any donations that are given. There's another foundation that gives two to one uh, for a dollar, up to so many dollars. And uh, that helps. It helps to know that we have foundations like this that uh, that does still care about it. And, the, and the, for, for the ones that uh, I'm sure everybody, is, I'm talking to Rotarians here, I know that, but for the Polio plus the plus is all the rest. The poli it's for the polio plus, clean water, sanitation, reading. It's all it's for all that. I hope I was helpful. Absolutely, and I'm uh, going to share something here from past uh, District Governor John Deacon. Mike, thanks for bringing your personal story to Rotarians in our district and answering the difficult questions to benefit the polio eradication from this earth. That is um, so very important. And, and I appreciate you sharing your personal story with us. John, um, as we move forward, if if donations are down in three, you know, uh, are down right now, and, and that comes back in three years, how can that hurt our efforts to eradicate what, you know, really is the last mile, which is oftentimes the hardest in eradicating a, a, a disease like polio? How, how important is it right now that we continue our donations to eradicate this, this disease? It's, it's critically important. Uh, the, uh, and as Mike mentioned, if you give a dollar to Polio Plus, it goes to work tomorrow. It doesn't work, it doesn't wait three years. And the Bill and Melinda Gates will match that two to one. But it's critically important that we can't stop because if we do stop, there will be a hundred, I don't know, I hate to quote a number, but this, it will just come back and, and the, we will have polio will be attacking and killing children again. We are down, you, people have heard for a long time, we've down to only three countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Nigeria. Well, Nigeria has only had three cases in the last seven years. They just, the, uh, the African uh, committee, I'm not sure the correct name, has just accepted the Nigerian report to be declared polio free. And it is expected that when the World Health Organization meets in August, they'll make that statement. It's been over four years since they've had a case, but that is a quite a milestone. That means the entire continent of Africa will be polio free. So we'd be down to just those two countries. And there, you know, we're having flare ups there. And because we're taking some of our polio workers away to help with the coronavirus i hope it doesn't get a whole lot worse when well, stopped but you know people are going to be spread so thin and mike was talking about polio plus you know that that several years ago there was an ebola breakout and one of the things that really helped stop it so quick was that they used the health the organization the the workers that we had uh, on the ground the cold chain storage supplies that we had on the ground that's how they got to where they needed to get to get stop the Ebola virus that quickly. So we can't stop. And if we can't give any other way, go online and do it. And there's again, that Q, QR code. Just put your Please. phone right up to it and uh, it'll, it'll pop the yes. screen right up. You know, I, we have just a moment here and, and this is a, I think more of a statement and this is from uh, Sam Holmstein, Rotary Club of Jones, bro. worry about the anti-vaccine movement allowing forgotten diseases to return to our shores and beyond. We, we've already seen it with the measles. Uh, just from the two of you, is this a concern for you? 
Well, it's been a concern, not just because of this, been a concern for years. It really makes me angry to, to when I see cases of outbreaks of measles or mumps, you know. I know I don't know when it stopped. You used to, you couldn't go to school unless you had those vaccinations. My kids are grown, but if that happened to one of my children going to a public school, I would do something. <laughs> I, I just, it just irritates me. But yes, Sam, that's a good point. And I don't know what to do about it. I think we ought to go back to where you had to be in his eyes to go to school. But I don't right. make those laws. That's right. Well, you know, you know, I hear so many people, you know, well, it's eradicated in the United States. Why do I need to have my child vaccinated? It, yes, it is. It is eradicated in the United States. It's been since 1989. But that one child that's in Afghanistan or Pakistan, they make a trip here, it could be all the same thing. It could spread just as, just as fast as this coronavirus has, as the flu does, it, until we eradicate the whole world of polio, it's still there. That is a great way to leave it. Mike Shelton, polio survivor, John Carter leading our district's efforts to uh, financially uh, support the eradication of polio. Thank you both uh, for joining us during this uh, conference, and I will turn things over now to, I believe, District Governor uh, George Frey. George? Yeah, it is a privilege to uh, introduce to you our Zone Director, Floyd Lancia, who serves as Rotary Director for Zones 30 and 31, which stretches from Ohio to Texas and is known as the heart of America, with a total of 30 districts. And as your District Governor, I report to him. Floyd uh, joined Rotary in 1970, and is the recipient of the Rotary Foundation's highest recognition, the Distinguished Service Award, the Rotary Foundation's Meritorious Service Award, and the Rotary International Service Above Self Award, and many other recognitions and awards. Please join me in welcoming Zone Director Floyd Lancia. Thank you, George. What a, what a special time for me, not only to be with you, in District 6150, but to follow John and Mike talking about the foundation. What a critical time we have with the coronavirus preventing some of the things that we need to do in order to help stop the spread of polio. And Mike pretty much hit the nail right on the head and so did John when they were talking about one case in our country will cause a spread just as the coronavirus has sped in our country. So I ask you to use that QR code, make your contribution because as John says, a portion of the annual fund comes back to your district in three years. And whatever you contributions you make for polio will be matched to the one by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. You know, this is a difficult time, but it's a special time because when current president, well, for the next few days, current president Mark Maloney in January of a year and a half ago selected his theme of Rotary Connects the World, who in the world would have thought that we would be connecting in this fashion? You know, this is like my third conference today, and I was online seven hours yesterday, but it's okay because I get an opportunity to spend time with Rotarians, friends of mine, who are, who are at this meeting, who I normally would not be able to see in person or get a chance to chat with. This coronavirus thing has caused uh, some difficulty, but clubs and districts like yours are experiencing a variety of ways to stay connected and to continue doing service projects and fundraising events. You know, we must, as Rotarians, clubs and districts, we must adapt to changes. We need to do those changes, but we need to keep it in a positive way so that we can continue doing the work that both Mike and John spoke of, not only here, here in our communities, but around the globe. And as Rotarians, we, we need to be flexible. And you're doing that today, creative and imaginative in order to keep our 
activities positive and keep the ball rolling in the right directions. As Rotarians, we need to adapt and improvise and overcome and continue to face the coronavirus and continue doing the things we need to do that causes Rotary to be what it is today and tomorrow. You know, not a, not but a few months ago, Rotary celebrated its 115th birthday. And if you go back to the 1905 when, when our founder Paul Harris and his friends met for the very first time on February 5th, the reason they met was for fellowship. And they maintained a bit of flexibility in how and where they met. As you may recall, they, they rotated from office to office. And that's how we got our name, Rotary. It's still important. We may not rotate from place to place. But nonetheless, we are connected through fellowship in so many other ways. Another way that we stay connected is how we deal with one of our core values of leadership. And when you think about the opportunities that we have, especially when we hold different positions in our communities, you know, some of us are professional business people, doctors, lawyers, business people. But when we join Rotary, we have an opportunity to become leaders in our community, not as individuals, but our individual talents stretch well beyond where we would be capable of doing if we were not united. So Rotary brings us together in united way. Together, you see, we have an opportunity to provide mentorship, especially for young people. Now, we may not know who those young people may be, but once we bring them into our clubs, we find that they grow in leadership because what I find is that young, people's in my, young people in my club and other clubs generally bring a great deal of energy and enthusiasm, wanting to get things done both locally and internationally. And when you speak about integrity, you know, we all live and abide by the four-way test. When we make a decision, hopefully we think about the four-way test and are we truthful and fair to all? Will our actions build goodwill? And of course, will we be beneficial to all those with whom we engage? And as Rotarians, we maintain a high ethical standard in business and professions. And we recognize the worthiness of useful occupations by dignifying each of our Rotarian friends, no matter what their occupation is. Because you see, we all belong to Rotary so that we can serve society. So those four values of the four-way test that we use, let's consider the diverse, diversity as another. You know, Rotary has always supported diversity. You know, as you can see from a variety of meetings and club events and district events that you attend, we come from a variety of race, creed, religious commitments, and political persuasion. See, Rotary touches something in every single person that goes deep in the hearts of each one of us. It's easy for us to uh, commit to diversity because, you see, when we look into a person's eyes, the first thing that we say, because or see, as we become, uh, as a, as whenever we become a Rotarian or when we're in a Rotary meeting, is that we see in their eyes that they are a potential friend. And service certainly is a thing that kind of binds us all. You know, we all come from a variety of clubs, some large, some small, some newly formed, some not so. And there's a variety of clubs now that exist, uh, corporate clubs, passport clubs, e-clubs, and so on. Imagine what your community would be if there was no Rotary Club. You know, the ability that Rotary gives us to provide service is really the ability to expand ourselves well beyond the bounds of each of us individually. See, service is a gift that gives for generation after generation. And the application of the ideal of service in each Rotarian's 
personal, business, and community life remains what we foster and encourage for the betterment of our communities. I call these core values touchstones. Touchstones are what makes Rotary unique and what will make Rotary preserve into the future. There's no better time to be a Rotarian. Every day is a good time to be a Rotarian. But today, with the social conditions and the health conditions, I'm proud to be a Rotarian because I know that the things that I do and the people that I come in contact with, we shed and we share and spread the word of doing good. So let's think about it. In 1905, when Paul Harris and his friends started Rotary, it only started in Chicago, as you know, with four individuals. But within a few years, it became a national organization. And before you know it, it became international. And the important thing about Rotary is the way it involves young people. Now, I'm not, I'm not familiar with whether you have an Interact, Rotaract, or we have RILA, or Youth Exchange. But involving youth in Rotary in innovative ways will find that those young people will provide us service in our communities. So as long as we keep Rotary alive in the hearts of young people, Rotary will have a secure future in the world. So Rotary stands for international understanding, goodwill, and peace. And the advancement of these principles throughout the world and the fellowship that we live in and business professions that we provide our families with unites us in the ideals of service. So every time we become engaged in any of the seven areas of focus, now that we have one for the environment, we create a bond of trust that finds a repository in the hearts and minds of all people that our service touches. Our service is extended through the world because it makes it a safer, kinder, and more peaceful place. Our Rotary of today will not be the same of tomorrow. Just as your meeting today, we've learned to pivot from in-person meetings to virtual meetings, and Rotary today cannot be the same as what it will be tomorrow. So think about the future. There are clubs that have already decided that they're going to get together and meet in person with social distancing. A club that I spoke with the other day is planning on beginning in-person meetings the middle of July. They're taking reservations, so they'll only allow three per table. But at the same time, they're going to be doing virtual meetings. So think of that. The future of Rotary will not be the same as it is today. And when I was district governor, the president of Rotary National was John Kenny. His theme was, the future of Rotary is in your hands. And thanks to each Rotarian, Rotary will continue to evolve as it does. See, Rotarians will continue to advance the international understanding, goodwill, and peace as we offer ourselves in service above self. You know, many of you were, were locked up at home as I was. You know, I kind of say locked up, but really, we were, we were asked to stay at home during the virus. It's been a couple of months. But what I did when I was home, I did an awful lot of rotary work, of course, as many of you may have done. But I also did some catching up, cleaning up, sorting, and pitching a lot of things that were on my desk that I thought for some day I would probably need those because they're extremely important, only to find out that they're not so important when you put things in perspective. But while in the process of working in my office, I had a thought. And the thought brought me back to a Charles Schultz book written for children. Charles Schultz from Muncie, Indiana, is the author of Peanuts. And the book that he wrote is entitled, Be Kind, Be Brave, Be You. I want to share some thoughts with you about that book. Because as Rotarians, we need to be kind. What do you see in your community or in your club 
that needs to be done? Do you reach out to the club president or the district governor and say, hey, I see a need here. Let's reach out. Let's do something because I know there's an elderly person in my club who can't make it to the grocery store. Can we do something to deliver groceries or some other essentials? There are other clubs that are making donations of their food that they normally would pay for at their meetings and they're donating the, the cost of their foods to pantries or other organizations. There are also many who have just make a phone call to a person who is homebound and shares kindness to relieve loneliness or help them realize that they're not alone. And what about the many young families who are feeling in overwhelmed because they're trying to teach their kids while they're home, working on their business, running their home life, a difficult time for them. So as Rotarians, let's be kind. Let's bring a smile to someone's face. Let's ask them to be happy. Let's ask them to connect with you. And as a Rotarian, be brave. It's easy to sit back and say, we can't do anything because the coronavirus prevents us from doing it. However, in a lot of the meetings that I've attended, just like this, I hear a lot about good things that are being done. Some clubs are holding fundraisers virtually while doing social distancing, while doing service projects, using this medium or other mediums to do that. See, many clubs are meeting just the way you are. They're having interesting speakers from any place in the world because it's so convenient. And what a great way to be connected and learn so about so many things in other parts of the world. You know, Mother Teresa once said, we cannot do great things, but we can do small things with great love. So be someone to somebody. Be brave. Be a Rotarian. And be you. You know, we're all Rotarians, and we all know that our motto is service above self. We also know that it's not a plaque that you just hang on the wall and look at it frequently or infrequently. In these times, we need to be creative and imaginative as we look at ways to do small service projects while maintaining social distancing. Inviting a prospective member to join you in a Zoom meeting or this type of a meeting is a great way to introduce someone to our organization. You see, they can do it from the comfort of their home and they can experience a discussion with someone perhaps from another part of the world. So think of the fun ways that you can be you while being a Rotarian. And being a Rotarian, you know, we need to encourage and foster the ideals of service as a basis of worthy enterprise and so on. To develop acquaintances as an opportunity for service and to maintain high ethical standards with the four-way test and so on, as I mentioned. While keeping in mind the application of ideal, the ideal of service that each one of us as Rotarians want to and do do. You know, Rotary has survived so many different difficulties. This is just one, the pandemic that we now face. A hundred, near, nearly a hundred, well, a little over a hundred years ago, the Spanish flu was another, H1N1, Ebola, other pandemics, two world wars, the Vietnam War, and so many other things that could have destroyed us, could have taken us off the track. But no matter what the setback was through all those years, we endured and we will continue to endure because we know the meaning of Rotary and we know the importance of serving others. I have five points I'd like to leave you with. The first is don't go back to normal. Keep embracing what you have learned virtually. Continue doing some of these. Do, do a hybrid. Whatever works best for you. Number two. Look at your future. Where do you want your club or your district to be in five years? Thinking of where we are today and how will you progress to be where you want to be in five years? 
and look for members who you can attract who are a good fit for your club and who you will be a good fit for them. Can you meet their expectations? And four, Mike, this is for you. Remember our promise to the children of the world to eradicate polio. So contribute to Polio Plus. And last, and certainly not least, have fun in Rotary. Thank you for allowing me to share some comments with you today. Well, thank you, Floyd. Floyd Lincia, the uh, Rotary, our Director of uh, Rotary International, with us uh, here today for District 6150. Thank you very much for those positive comments and taking a few minutes with us. Um, you know, one of area uh, Rotary six areas of focus has been to promote peace. You know, that has uh, been difficult in uh, recent times, and, and the pandemic has only made things a little more uh, challenging. But how has Rotary's approach to peace building changed to promote cohesion and inclusion? Okay, I'm, I'm unmuted now, I see. Okay, good. Yes, well, you know, the, uh, you don't know, but inclusion, diversity, and equity is a critical concern of Rotary International as it is with others in the world. The president of Rotary International and the incoming president of Rotary International have scheduled a meeting in July and they have they have selected a task force to come back with a recommendation that will be discussed and be discussed thoroughly at that meeting that has to do with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now that doesn't answer your 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 question totally about peace, but we need to have those sorts of things that take place in order to have peace in the world. And along that same line, as you know, we have peace centers. And one of the areas of focus, as you mentioned, is peace and conflict resolution. That will always be. And if you think about the variety of areas of focus that we have, you can't have peace without water and sanitation. I mean, you can't have peace with a variety of other areas of focus. They're all interconnected. You know, there, there are instances where there's conflict over water. So peace is an important aspect of it. And with the, with the, uh, with the peace centers, there are, there are nearly, well, there's slightly over a thousand now peace graduates who now go out, graduate, and then go to conflict areas and try to create peace throughout those areas. I hope I've answered your question. Absolutely. And, you know, it's events like this that we, we share ideas. We pollinate, cross-pollinate ideas, right, from district to district. And uh, you uh, you mentioned you were on a Zoom different Zoom meetings for seven hours yesterday. Had been on two or three already today. Yes. What are some of the great uh, stories and events, positive um, movements that you're hearing across Rotary in the U.S.? What, what are, can you share some some details from what you're hearing? Sure. Uh, you know the one uh, one of the meetings I mentioned that I was at the other day. Uh, the you know I, I heard John talk about the happy bucks well they do happy bucks so I said well how do you do that I mean you're on you're on zoom how do you do the happy bucks well I got apparently there's a there's an app on a phone that they just everybody's got it on their smartphone and then they just commit to that and it sends it to this fellow with the got the got the collection <laughs> whatever you call it I don't remember the name of the app but it was clever and then he writes a check to the foundation or to the treasury or whatever they do I mean that was just one interesting thing I found Another is, like I mentioned earlier, you know, there's more than one club, including mine, that's thinking about meeting in person, but sending out a request or RSVP so that they can social distance and have enough meals because there are some who will not come. And the fact that we can also run simultaneous virtual meeting while we're in person. Um, and, and, you know, seeing senior leaders meet with so many organizations because of the way it is now it's really rewarding and it's so 
touching to see that you know President Holger I don't know I can't even get a hold of him he's and, and Mark you know President Mark he's got a few days left but I mean his schedule was like booked tried to get him to do a video the other day and I mean it's almost impossible to get through to him so that those are the kinds of stories I guess that that uh, really are touching because senior leaders are always available to share their stories and to be with you and to give you the latest and newest things and uh, just to, just to remind you there are now seven areas of focus and the seventh area of focus is environment that was a huge huge thing that came it was it was voted unanimously by the board of trustees that's where the areas of focus begin and then just the other day it was approved unanimously by the board of directors so there will now be seven and again just as peace is a portion of every single part of the other areas of focus environment will be as well so uh, just uh, allowing me for to ramble on a bit <laughs> thank you no absolutely very important in fact uh, John Deacon uh, pastor uh, district uh, 6150 governor I just mentioned in the chat window I hear that the environment is the seventh so you you yes. nail on the uh, nail on the head there you know one of the uh, one of the five focus points that you had for us uh, one of them is uh, you know look at our future and where do we want to be in five years in terms of Rotary, Rotary International, where do you want the club to be in five years? Well, it's interesting that you should ask that because the board has a special committee that has been established that's entitled Shaping Rotary's Future. They gave a report at our meeting just this past week. It was pretty comprehensive. There'll be another one coming out in October and then there'll be a timeline. I, I don't want to go into the details of how it actually is, but Rotary Rotary International is looking at the future of how we will be in the next five years. And what will happen is most probably those of you who are on that remember future vision, there were a hundred districts that were, that were selected in order to go through that future vision exercise for three years. And in all probability, they'll do 100 districts who will do the similar situation under Rotary's uh, shaping Rotary's future? So that'll come out sometime late fall. Absolutely. Um, you know, backing up and in, in speaking of the environment and it being our seventh focus, give us a little history of that. Uh, how did that come to be? And and I, I I mean, we all know the importance of of making sure that our environment is there. For future generations but what was what, were, what are some big takeaways there and why that was a, a big focus sure and and this is not attributed to any individual in particular but those of you who remember ian risley from australia he was president just a few years ago well his whole focus well not all his whole focus but much of his focus as president was to plant trees and and wherever he went whether it was a 100th anniversary celebration or whether it was a district conference or whatever it might be, there was, always a, there was always a period of time where he was there planting trees. And, and talking with him just a few weeks ago, I guess he was hoping that well, there would be 1.2 million trees planted during his year. And that's a number of Rotarians. Wow. Well, it ended up being in excess of 4 million. After 4 million, they just lost count. So that was an impetus, one of the impetus. The other is a more recent uh, Rotary president, and that's Barry Rassen, who is from Nassau, Bahamas. The consideration for what happens with the oceans over a period of time could very well be that most of the islands in the Bahamas could be underwater. So there's a concern there as well. So it's important that we all jump on board and look at this thing as really critical and do what we can to help preserve our environment, not only for us, but for our future generations. So hopefully that answered your question. Absolutely, absolutely. Floyd Lindsay, a director, Rotary International. You have a busy schedule and I appreciate you sharing it with us. It's my delight, and say hi to the folks. Uh, I'm, you know, really with Zoom, I can see all the photos, but I can't see them. So, hi to everybody that I know, and I hope you have a great weekend and a great year because next year the theme is Rotary opens opportunities. So there you go. 
So thank Abs you. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much. And we are going to transition now, and uh, we have some music now from the Rotary Club of Lawrence County. Another wonderful musical tribute. Thank you again for those talented Rotarians out of Lawrence County. And we want to just quickly uh, reference the question that popped up time and time again in our chat box about the app. It is Venmo, we're told. So for those of you who had that question, the app that was referenced is Venmo. You know, service projects are the fundamental way Rotarians can demonstrate the motto that you heard Mr. Lance, Lancia talking about, service above self. Uh, and it's also the way that Rotarians can be the change in their communities. And you've often heard this, I'm sure, a way to demonstrate uh, leadership and contributing your time, talent, and treasure, the three T's. Rotarians don't just see a need, they use their skills and their expertise to meet it. So we now have a group of club leaders whose clubs are doing some amazing projects to make their respective communities better. Would you please help us welcome now to the panel discussion, Ms. Debbie Davis, who is the president of the Rotary Club of Wynn. Also, Michelle Blassengame, the president of the Rotary Club of Stuttgart. And a point of personal privilege, because I just love this guy. He's awesome. Mr. Hank Kelly the president of the Rotary Club of Little Rock. Good afternoon to all of you wonderful Rotarians. Let's just go down the list very quickly and share a little bit about your projects, and then we're going to turn it over to Hatton for Q&A. Debbie, let's start with you, followed by Michelle and then uh, Hank. Okay. We uh, had our meeting the other day for the first time in a long, long time, and I shared some of the projects that we've had this year. And and it, when you read it all together, it is shocking how much you can accomplish in a year. But uh, some of our projects have been the back to school project where we actually fill the backpacks for the students with all their supplies throughout the year that they will need in school. We helped with a putting on the ridges golf tournament for the downtown of Wynn. We had a polio piggy bank thing that we uh, had piggy banks on everybody's tables to put their uh, pocket change in in the month of October. We have given 100 turkeys and cake mixes and frosting to all of the area food banks uh, for their Christmas holiday. So every 100 families anyway had a good holiday meal for Christmas. We um, support the boys to girls clubs in Wynn. We have a charter uh, of the Boy Scout Troop number 18 that our Rotary Club chartered it. And uh, I just signed a paper for them the other day uh, that we would continue our support with that. We always have a girls softball team that we sponsor. We have a program called 363 that we help fill the backpacks that they carry home 
um, from school every weekend so that they will have needs that the kids uh, can have food, supplies, shampoos. Uh, we keep our little uh, toiletries that we get at hotels and we send those home. So we support that. Um, the, our biggest thing that we've done this year also are we have given a $500 to the literacy program at Wynn High School. This will help them to replenish their book supply in whatever way they need. And they start with preschool up through eighth grade. And our latest project is our gazebo. And I'm very proud of that gazebo. Um, it's out at the pond area on the uh, sports complex. And I drive out sometimes at lunch just to watch people sitting in it in the shade while their families are fishing, the soccer games go on nearby. And, you know, if they're out there, they have a place to get in out of the shade, out of the sun, and uh, just enjoy their time. It's a beautiful park, and it's a beautiful gazebo. I'm really proud of that. And our entire club has helped with these projects. I, I've, I've really had a lot of help this year, and I'm real proud of them. Well, thank you very much for sharing that exciting news. And that is indeed an impressive gazebo. You might get some uh, questions about support in other areas because of that phenomenal work you've done there. Thank you so much, Debbie. Let's check in now with Michelle Blassengame from Stuttgart. Michelle? Hey, Pam. How are you? The, the uh, Stuttgart Rotary Club is all about our community. This year, we've given roughly a little over $15,000 in local scholarships for seniors. We've donated over $25,000 for different projects and events that are, were, uh, that were going on throughout the year. The things that we're most proud about is our COVID-19 service projects. We realized back in March when we could no longer meet for our meetings that that did not mean that we could not serve or continue to serve our community. So what we did is um, at, when the COVID-19 started and they started needing to do testing and screening in our local hospital, we helped them set up a drive through service uh, where we actually manned the drive through eight hours a day, Monday through Friday for four weeks so that um, people could have access to um, healthcare and the COVID-19 testing. We also, through connections of Rotary Club members, we procured about 30,000 masks uh, to give to our Baptist Health System, uh, Baptist Health of Stuttgart. We also provided gloves and masks for our local nursing home. Uh, we also had teams of Rotarians that had certain people in town that were at risk um, and could not get out. They did their grocery shopping for them. They delivered their drugs to them from their pharmacy. Um, anything that they needed, the Rotarians were there to help them. We also fed all of our healthcare workers. We fed all of uh, the employees at the hospital uh, here in Stuttgart. We also, um, everyone at our medical clinic and everyone at our nurse, nursing home. Um, so we are, we're proud uh, about that. We're continuing to support our community through this crisis um, by being there and letting them know we're there for them. And um, we're excited to get back to seeing each other face to face. But we know for a fact that our uh, club has been out there and our community sees us every day. And that's what's the most important to us. Thank you, Michelle. Way to pivot to uh, meet the needs of your community in a, in a very tangible way. So we appreciate hearing more about your efforts in Stuttgart. Well, this gentleman I've had the pleasure of working with personally and love the mask, by the way. <laughs> uh, I've had the pleasure of working with personally through uh, all of the uh, collective efforts of the Rotarians in the Little Rock area and I will not steal his thunder. So we'll let you share more about that great work, Mr. Hank Kelly. From Thank you, Pam. Uh, really appreciate uh, that introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, it's been a real ple pleasure to uh, be the president of Rotary Club 99 this year. We uh, had worked for a year before uh, my tenure to get a signature project lined up and it was to adopt Dunbar Middle School, and we named that project uh, Dunbar Middle School Bobcats Thrive because they are the Bobcats. Uh, and Thrive stands for teachers, helpers, Rotarians, 
interact for victory of every student. Um, we established a one-on-one -on -one mentoring program with the Dunbar students. We trained uh, through working with Pam and the Little Rock School District, 60 of our members to be one-on-one -on -one mentors, and we went through a training program called Volunteers in Public Schools. We started off by hosting a Dunbar Middle School teacher and administration reception to let the teachers and the administrators know we really cared about them. Uh, we engaged uh, an interact club that we had already set up at Catholic High to be mentors to the Dunbar students, and they were older students than our middle school Dunbar students, and so it worked out really good. The Catholic High students came in and offered a hand to help get that set up. We then directly engaged our 99 members on the project you just saw was to uh, scrape, uh, paint, prepare uh, the lockers uh, on the ground floor of Dunbar to show the Dunbar students that we were in their school and cared about them. We contracted with a professional painting company so that they wouldn't be peeling uh, uh, two weeks after we painted them, but we did the prep work and got it set up for them. We also did something a little different for the students through some relationships we had with First Tee Golf. We thought it might be some, there might be some great life skills through the First Tee program and for any of you uh, Rotarians that are out there that are looking for a great program where the kids have fun and still teach core values of, of treating people courteously and the rules of golf were instilled in the students that took that. Uh, we brought our Rotarians in that are uh, skilled in financial matters, literacy, they taught literacy classes, stock market classes, cooking classes, and nutritional classes. We set up a, a cookout for the Dunbar middle school football game and took the proceeds of that cookout uh, and helped fund a band trip to New Orleans. That was a lot of fun as we fed the, the football players after their game. And let me tell you, they can eat some hamburgers. Uh, we we uh, donated, as I said, uh, those funds to help the band uh, not only acquire some instruments, and we collected instruments from our different members that had instruments in their closets that were perfectly good but not being used. And then we counseled with the teachers and the administrators on how to better connect with our business community. The slides that you're seeing now is another project we work, worked on, which was a day camp that Little Rock School District Superintendent Mike Poor came to us and said, would you guys add some fun and flavor to a day camp? The Little Rock School District wants to set up a, a daycare camp for the workers at UAMS that are fighting the pandemic. And as you can see, our members embraced that idea and had a blast. They dressed up in uniforms and the kids that came in at first were a little reluctant about what they were doing. And when they saw our Rotarians with their big smiles and their funny costumes, uh, it, it eased their angst and we, we made a good connection there. Uh, finally, we worked really hard with the Clinton Foundation. One of our members, Stephanie Street, is the head of the Clinton uh, Foundation, and she invited us to get involved with a program of Feed the Students. And uh, we, the mission was to feed the students that weren't going to school because they weren't getting their normal meals. You see there our Rotarian Mayor Frank Scott on the assembly line, working, pitching in, hand in hand. Ellen Cockrell of our club spent endless hours coordinating and, and providing essentially a a logistical hub for the Feed the Kids program by talking to drivers on where they needed to go. And Ellen loved the interaction with the different members. Some of the testimonials we've gotten from our members were just thanks for creating projects where we could get involved in the community. We've gotten more out of those projects than we've given and we want to do more. Pam, thanks again very much for giving us the opportunity to showcase these projects. We're just happy to be of service to the community. Thank you. Well, and, and thank you and all Rotarians for what you do. And you, you were able to put together these projects. And um, I want to ask you the same, the same question to each of you um, because I, I feel like it's important and we might, we might learn something. Um, through, through the pandemic, it, it presented a lot of challenges, right, that we weren't able to, to do. And uh, Debbie, you talked about the Backpack uh, for Kids program 
and uh, the literacy and the gazebo at the sports complex, which is a great addition to a fantastic uh, facility on top of that. But how are you able to overcome some of the challenges of, of uh, logistics in, in a pandemic to get some of these things done? Well, thank goodness we started early so that things were already in motion, you know, to get the gazebo built. And it was a little bit of a delay because the man that was building it was in northern Illinois and he wasn't traveling wow. and you know, nobody was. So we had to kind of wait till everything lifted a little bit before he could bring it down here. And but uh, he did and everything just kind of fell into place. Um, we had to do some some things a little different rather than presenting things in in person to the entire school group. We had to present it to the literacy coach and, you know, just we just worked through it. But well, we're finally getting to start back a little bit slowly but surely as a group. Absolutely. And, and Michelle, your uh, organization there, um, you, you transitioned saw a need in the community during this um, pandemic, and you were able to um, not only feed the medical uh, workers that are there, but you manned clinics, um, 30,000 masks for the local hospital. That's amazing. Walk me through uh, some of the challenges that you, that you had to work through to be able to pull some of that off. Well, just like anyone else, uh, when we stopped meeting, um, we felt a need to make sure that our community knew that we were still out there and we were still serving them and we were still there to help. And so we text each other, we emailed, and the Stuttgart Rotarians were incredibly gracious with their personal time to come and help us. I mean, eight hours a day for four weeks is a long time. And they get time from their families and their jobs and things that they were doing. And, and it was important. It was important that our community saw that we were still out there that we were still supporting them. Um, it, as far as coordinating the efforts, uh, a lot of our Rotarians, our fellow Rotarians, uh, work for the hospital, work for administrators, work for nursing homes, work for several um, uh, companies here in Stuttgart, one in particular, the Fortune 500, uh, that is a Fortune 500 company, so that we had those connections. And we, we made sure that we used our connections to do what our community needed and what, what they were asking for. And we asked our what is it that you need? And they were clear. And when they told us what we needed, then we sat down and said, then this is what we can do. This is what we can tackle. The Rotarians just started calling in and emailing and it all worked out. It's what Absolute, we Absolutely. And uh, you hit the nail on the head, find the need and, and go attack it. And, you know, Hank, Hank and Little Rock with Dunbar uh, Middle School Project um, and the mentoring program that you had and, and a one-on-one -on -one relationship that Rotarians were able to build with the students at Dunbar Middle School. Obviously, with not being able to meet in class, that changed things. Were Rotarians able to connect one-on-one -on -one with the students after uh, the quarantine started? You know, Hatton, I, I would admit to you it's been more difficult not being able to physically go to the school. And one of the things through our training at, at the Volunteers in Public Schools that we learned is that we needed to be respectful of the student and their parents' private space and sure. not just assume this was our child. I have nine grandchildren, so it's pretty easy for me to add a mentee into my life with that sort of engagement that I have with my grandchildren. Some of our members wanted to know, how do I start? How do I form a bond with this student who doesn't I think the same way I think from an age standpoint, but also the demographics are different. 92% of our students we engaged with were part of a school lunch program. And, and so we felt connected to that school as if we could open some doors for those students if we could just engage and get to know them. And as we brought students to our Rotary Club and they saw that we had smiling faces and we patted them on the back when we could do that and we shook their hands back when we could do that and and gave them honors and awards for good grades we did that to show them that we cared about them um, it has it has suffered 
because we can't physically be together. But individually, some of those mentor-mentee relationships have continued on and we've stayed in touch. We will re-engage as soon as we can physically do that. And the administration at Dunbar has given us wide open arms to say, please keep doing this for more than one year. And our club made a five-year commitment to this program that it was not going to be a one year and only because we know those relationships build on its, itself and on each other. And so um, on the other hand, Hatton, the, the Feed the, the Students program, uh, we won't claim credit for that program, but our Rotarian in charge has been leading it. And they fed over 500,000 meals since they started that program. And Rotarian Ellen Cockrell has been right in the middle of all that with Rotarian Stephanie Street, along with AmeriCorps and a lot of other people that President Clinton recently uh, honored in a uh, outreach program to them to thank them for hitting that milestone of providing 500,000 meals. And we're just a small part of it, but we think we, we helped and when asked to serve, we served and we came in for that. Well. Hank, Debbie, Michelle, you're all doing fantastic work across the district, and thank you for what you do, and uh, stay healthy and safe, and I will turn things now back over to Pam. Thank you, Hatton, and to that wonderful panel. That was such an awesome discussion. It reminds me of a question that a friend asked me about his special team. When you ask if someone is a Rotarian, the question might be, isn't everybody? Because if you're doing great works, then you must be a Rotarian because that's what you're all about. Uh, what an what an awesome, awesome presentation. And speaking of service and projects, we are going to hear now about a very impactful effort uh, by a Rotarian who has moved mountains, not just in her own backyard, but across the globe. She is joining us from District 6710 in Kentucky, District Governor-elect Joanne Hepperman. And I'm sure you will be quite inspired with her story and the work that the Rotarians in Kentucky are doing to end the number one killer of women in Haiti and much of the developing world. We hope you were able to check out her video because it was sent out yesterday and it was so powerful. But if not, you still will have time to visit the district website where you can find the full presentation. Please help us give a hearty welcome virtually to Joanne Hepperman. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You know, it is a uh, privilege to be a part of your uh, district conference virtually. I was at my own district conference this morning virtually. Uh, and so what a deal, two different, two different district conferences in, uh, in one day. And I've learned some things about you. Number one, you all are singers. I've got to see like the last hour and a half, you're singers. And I particularly enjoyed uh, listening to uh, your three Rotarians talk about community service and help uh, prove again that while our projects may be different, and the needs may be different. We Rotarians are not COVID-19 or otherwise. But I'm actually here to talk to you uh, today. I do hope you had an opportunity to see the uh, video. In it, I talk about my district's efforts to end cervical cancer in Haiti. It is a leading cause of death of women there. And the reason for that is because of the lack of available or affordable detection methods. But the good news is that's changing. And the even better news is you can be a part of that. What's happening now, there are screening methods available now uh, that actually use ordinary vinegar, where uh, a woman's cervix can be swabbed with ordinary vinegar. If there are any precancerous lesions present, they will turn white uh, immediately, and then they can be frozen and, if necessary, removed. That means we've saved a life because in Haiti, if the lesions have turned cancerous, then that's a death sentence for the women of Haiti. And so, so what we've learned is the trick is you have to catch this early. 
Well, we actually discovered this through a guest speaker at one of our Rotary Club meetings. And at that meeting, we learned that we could train doctors and nurses and midwives in Haiti to administer that test. And so we talked about it and the truth of the matter is we sort of wanted to be in the business of saving lives, uh, particularly lives that don't need to be lost at all to a disease that no one needs to have anymore. And so um, we found a partner to work with on the ground in Haiti. We applied for a global grant. We eventually got the grant. We made our way to Fonfred, Haiti, which is in the southernmost part of Haiti. Haiti's a boot. It's shaped like a boot. It's uh, literally on the, the ball of the foot. And uh, uh, we went and we outfitted the uh, little bitty clinic uh, that our partner had there. We trained the doctor and nurse uh, who uh, worked with our partner, and we screened 15 women while we were there. Uh, what we now know is that the uh, global grant allowed us to uh, basically pay for this for uh, 18 months. Well, the grant ended in September of 2018, but the really good work continues to go on with our partner. And what we know is in the year that the, uh, the grant was uh, instrumental in making this happen, that we saved 44 lives. Thousands of women found out that they could be screened close to a thousand were screened and 44 of them had precancerous lesions. 14, we were too late. And so we know our work is not done. And as a um, result of that, we uh, applied for global grants number two and three, which actually I think are being submitted today. Uh, but in global grants two and three, we will be able to set up uh, three more sites and outfit a mobile clinic that will be able to uh, serve the women in the hinterlands around these sites where it actually is too far for the women to walk. This is the mode of transportation in Haiti for women. They walk uh, and six miles round trip or uh, six miles one way actually is about the maximum that they can do in a day and be seen and tested, et cetera, et cetera. So anyhow, uh, the mobile clinic will allow our partners to serve uh, those women as well. But where we work, where my district works, represents one of the four areas in Southern Haiti that is dreadfully underserved. And our dream is that clubs and other districts will join us in our effort to end cervical cancer there that districts like yours would adopt one of the other three areas in Haiti and claim as yours uh, that area and then go about the business of doing what my district is doing, basically saving lives. At the moment, uh, the day will come, let, let me just say it this way, the day will come when we hope to vaccinate boys and girls because this is how you kill cervical cancer. But until that's possible, what we know we can do is stop the dying now of the women, mainly between 20 and 40, who are dying from cervical cancer. And with your help, we can save one life after another, and you too can be in the business of saving women's lives in Haiti. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to forewarn you. If you become involved in this project, the women of Haiti will win your hearts. They're counting on us, but you won't be able to walk away. On the last day that my group was in Fonfred, 
there was a community celebration where the women came to see us off. And at that celebration, the women were asked if they had any questions for us. Eight women stood up and talked about mothers and daughters and sisters who had died from cervical cancer, but that they now had hope that they would not because we had come. That morning changed my life. And I know, I know that if this dream was not a part of my club's dream and now my district's dream, we have up to 13 clubs who are working with us on this. If it were not, if this dream was not a part of my life, my life would be easier but it would not be blessed in the way that it is blessed now. You know what? Every now and then, ordinary people, ordinary people are given an opportunity to do extraordinary things. And this is one of them. Come join us and you'll see what I'm talking about. So thank you. Thank you for letting me be a part of this. And I think you're going to hand me off now to Hatton, who hopefully will ask me easy questions and answer any questions that you might have about what this is all about and how you can be a part of it. Absolutely. And I, I hope that you know all the answers to what I'm going to ask Joanne. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> you, you, you have such, um, you're, you're such an inspiring person and you know, to go back and, and talk about the um, the women that you visited with there and how they discussed the the women in their lives that meant so much to them that had died of cervical cancer and that you gave them hope. That you gave them hope. That's that is really profound. And you said it changed you. What does it mean to you to give somebody hope in a situation like that? Well, how long do you have? Let's see. <laughs> you know what? What I what I uh, discovered. Um, for me, um, being able to uh, look into the eyes of a woman who fights every day just to live. And to be able to see the courage and the determination to um, do what it takes to live. And, and, and we're able to make that happen. Unfortunately, for well, it's not, not unfortunately, that's a really bad word. My husband might use the word, unfortunately. Fortunately for me, boy, it gave me purpose. It gave me, I, you know, and to be honest, I don't know what more I can ask for at this point in my life. It gave me purpose. I know why I'm here. Wow, what a deal. That's incredible. And a big part of eliminating the um, uh, cervical cancer is the need for the HPV, uh, HPV vaccine, not only in Haiti, but in the United States and around the world, uh, what do we need to do for an HPV vaccine? Well, you know, um, in the United States, I can't address that uh, question because uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know the answer in Haiti. And boy, this is where it is tough. Uh, the vaccines throughout the world, there really is a large group. There's a conglomeration of folks who work vaccines in third world countries. Uh, and it's the World Health Organization and Gavi are the two main organizations, but they will only work with the governments of the countries that they serve. And they will only work with those governments once the governments have in place a plan to, um, to, to vaccinate the uh, boys and girls in that country. I do believe at one point, uh, and this would have been about a year and a half ago, that the Haitian government was very interested in our 
being a part of that plan. And then Haiti sort of fell apart. I mean, Haiti's been in chaos for like a year and a half, uh, long before COVID-19 came. But the uh, the good news is Rotary International itself, the uh, incoming um, head of the Rotary Foundation has expressed an interest in uh, ending cervical cancer through vaccination because it's a disease we can kill. This is what we do. This is what Rotary does. And the groundwork is in place. And so, um, so we've had a bit of a setback uh, since March because we're working on some other things. Uh, and even in polio, we're having problems. But to my way of thinking that uh, I will share with the trustee foundation and anybody else that will listen, while we're vaccinated, when we find a vaccine for COVID-19 and, uh, and are about the business of vaccinating boys and girls, why not just vaccinate them for the HPV virus at the same time? Why not? Why not? But stable government, that's what we need more than anything else is a stable government. Um, and in Haiti, sometimes what you have to do is work really hard while the government is stable because you never quite know when it's not going to be. Wow. Things we take for granted here. When um, you, you, um, you talked about the fact that, uh, you know, we should pick a, a spot in Haiti and get started what do we need to do to get started? I know reach out and, and contact you, but what are the next steps? Well, the, the first thing that um, we would help you do is connect you with a partner on the ground. This was our godsend. We actually tried to do this with an organization in the United States and it just didn't work. It took us a year and a half to figure that out, but it didn't work. Uh, through the grace of God, we actually found a Haitian run and found it in run. Um, group Capricare in Fon Fred. And, and so then we um, began the um, dialogue about how we could make this work. They were, what was interesting is they were interested in having some type of reproductive services for women because they had none. And they heard about what we had and thought this would be a great way for them to go forward. The beauty is Capricare is well known in the Southern half of Haiti. We have an, another new partner, Maison de Naissance, uh, which is a birthing home, which is, uh, the, will be the beneficiary of one of the global grants. They're well known. But those folks have also managed to introduce us to folks in the surrounding areas as well. So we would uh, introduce you to people in the ground, on the ground in Haiti, who are interested in um, testing women for cervical cancer. And once that happens, you know what? It just all falls in place after that. It just truly falls in place after that. Wow. District Governor-elect Joanne Hepperman from uh, District 6710 in Kentucky, working to end cervical cancer, not only in Haiti, but around the world. Thank you for taking time to, to share your story and your cause with us. Thank you. And we will turn things back over to Pam. Pam. Testimony. I was saying thank you, Hatton and Ms. Hepperman. Uh, what a powerful testimony of the great work that is being done, not just locally and nationally, but globally. And that Rotarians not only have the care to do the work, but they have the commitment to see it through. So thank you all for your continued efforts. So we are now at the point of the program for which many of you have been anxiously awaiting. Can you guess what that is? Yes, indeed. It is awards time. And these awards represent a year of extremely hard work, dedication, and you heard me say this just a minute ago, commitment on the part of the clubs and their membership. Our district governor, will now announce these very important and exciting awards. Governor Frey. Thank you, Pam. The awards presentation part of our program today reflect the hard work on the part of individuals and clubs. And these achievements make me very proud as district governor. The uh, first category of awards is for membership. Now, six clubs finish with at least five members above their beginning number. And these clubs are as follows. 
on Rock After Hours, Sherwood, Stuttgart, Little Rock Metro, West Memphis, and Forest City. The next area of awards goes to club presidents for outstanding leadership. You had to finish the year with more members than what you began with, and you had to have projects, uh, uh, particularly during the pandemic. The first one uh, to recognize is Darren Cullum, West Memphis, Chris Hegel, Forest City, Sally Cook, Blyville, Adam Sarton, uh, Jonesboro University, Ashley Geringer, Jacksonville, Mike Shelton, Lawrence County, Hank Kelly, Little Rock 99, Stephanie Shine, uh, Little Rock After Hours, Christina Root, Mariana, Charles Bryant, Mariana, I mean, Charles Harris, uh, Mariana, I mean, uh, Charles Harris, uh, uh, Little Rock Metro, Brian Dunham, Osceola, uh, John Kraft, uh, Stray Trimble, uh, Michelle Blassengang, Jay Lambert, Anthony Galloway, Donna Cole, Virginia Young, Vicki Shelby, and Debbie Davis. The next category that I want to recognize is the assistant governors. And uh, they do so much. Uh, uh, and they're the go-between between between the governor and the club. And they they, uh, certainly make visits to these clubs and try to provide direction and and guidance. First one is Eugene Wing, Tyler Dunnigan, Dennis Delp, Kelly Lush, Renee Brink, King Casbeer, Nancy Churchwell, Nancy Shefflett, Leslie Dennison, Sonia Smith Murphy, Barbara Neal, uh, Jerry Lodegar, Dan Mullen, and David Leach. The next area is for outstanding services to the district. And the first uh, to be recognized is Sydney Gilbert. And she has been a helper and a servant to all of us in the district this year. The second is Dr. Jennifer Dillahay. She has worked hard all, I mean, all spring on the COVID-19 epidemic. And certainly she has uh, worked with us and helped us all to adapt. Third is Sam Hummelstein. He has done an outstanding job preparing for these COVID-19 updates in our first virtual conference. Can't say enough about Sam. Quite a friend to the, to the district. The fourth is Hatton Weeks. He has been of tremendous service as a moderator and advisor for district events. And the fifth is Mark Moro. He was chief of staff and he did an outstanding job. Now, the next area is the governor's banner. And you must meet the criteria that's listed in the club recognition points. The first uh, one is Blyville. Uh, second was Jacksonville, Jonesboro, Jonesboro University, Lawrence County, Little Rock 99, uh, Little Rock After Hours, Little Rock Metro, Paragool, Sherwood, Stuttgart, West Little Rock, and Wynn. The next category will be the club of the years. And this take, this took a lot of, a lot of, uh, thought to, to we come to these conclusions. The, the first is the small club category, and that is Little Rock Metro. The second being the small medium, and that would be Sherwood. And the third is win for the medium club. And the fourth is the large club, and that would be Jonesboro. The last award is for Rotarian of the Year. And the Rotarian of the Year is the, is the most coveted individual award from the district. And the recipient always represents service, loyalty, and devotion to the ideals of Rotary. The recipient for this award this year is Vince Guest. In closing, we are a district of achievers, and I want to thank each of you for your support this year. When I reflect back this time a year ago, we had plans for a year that had been in our dreams, but not in our wildest dreams, we could have predicted a pandemic. And I'm grateful to have been on this journey with the great people of 6150 and how resilient you are and how you've adapted and you've worked to help others in your community to adapt. 
We have looked for ways to make the lives of others in our communities better and to ease the pain. But that is who we are, and we will do it again and again if the need arises. And I'm very proud of a year that we built together. I wouldn't have had it any other way. And I want to thank of each of you for being a part of this conference today. And I want to thank all the participants and recognize Pam Smith, Sidney Gilbert, Sam Hubblesteam, and Hatton Weeks for a job well done. So thanks for the memories. Thank you so much, Governor Frey. What an awesome conference. And I'd like to call it a celebration. I know that um, we did take care of a little bit of business, but we also shared some wonderful work information about all of the things that are happening in clubs that represent your awesome district. So thank you very much, Governor Frey, and thank you all attendees for taking time from your day to spend with us to celebrate and participate in the conference. I know that I am preaching to the choir when I share this, but I always love to find little tidbits that I hope are inspirational to others as I'm visiting with them, but it's about helping others and it goes right along with your service above self motto. The purpose of life is not to be happy, it is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, and to make some difference that you have lived and lived well. No one has ever become poor by giving. Thank you again for celebrating and sharing in the conference with us today. This is going to be the end of the broadcast, but we're asking that you please join District Governor George Frey and District Governor-elect Mike Benage on Zoom for the district's business meeting. You've been emailed the link to the Zoom meeting, and you will find the link in the comments in the live stream. Thank you again, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.